And if Mike, you could do the pledge. Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And Jimmy, you could do the prayer. Thank you, sir. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you once again tonight and just to thank you for the many blessings you bestowed on this little town. We ask that you continue to be with us, lead and guide us, I would please thee. Lead, uh, lead these council members that they can make those decisions that will affect us for the time to come. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy and Mike. Uh, Sandy, if we could do a roll call. Pam Samples. William Ellis. Here. Scott Oldham. Here. Trevor Sager. Here. Dan Swafford. Okay, um, first thing as uh, account action, approval minutes for the work session, January 18th, 2022, and the regular meeting, January 24th, 2022. So moved. Second. Okay, Sandy. William Ellis. Yes. Scott Oldham. Yes. Trevor Sager. Yes. Motion carries. All right, next we have action to pay accounts payable vouchers and payroll. So moved. Second. Andy? William Ellis? Yes. Scott Oldham? Yes. Trevor Sager? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Uh, Guys, I'm having, I'm having trouble here. Um, people are cutting in and out. Is it just me or is anybody else having trouble with the recording? I'm okay on my end. No, it's fine. But... Mine seems pretty good too. <coughs> and I see a Dan coming in. Is that Dan Swafford? Or is that Dan Rary? I believe that's Dan Rary. Today was his special day. Does the anybody day. else have a bad connection? Not right this time. No. I'm good. As am I. Sorry, Darla. It sounds like it's probably on your end. Okay, next on the agenda is Parks and Rec Board. Um, Jimmy, have we had any action on that? We have not. I uh, have a candidate, uh, Ron Van Diebener. He's our uh, uh, planning inspector, building inspector here in town. He's very interested. So I'd like to, to move, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, suggest that Ron be made a permanent member of the uh, Parks Board. Um, I, I hope the rest of you saw Darla's email that um, um, Ron had, we had, you had previously appointed him to the BZA. So you need to kind of let him hear from him and then verify his choice before you appoint him to the board, park board. And Sandy or Darla, um, I don't know how, how clear Darla can respond, but if the BZA, it's not services pleasure, would Ron need to resign from that? And yeah, then we appoint? He's already done that. Okay. He's already done, yes. All right, so Ron, what's your, what's your thoughts on what you want to do? Well, my thoughts is I want to be on the parks board. I have uh, sent a letter to uh, Kevin Talati and Denise uh, resigning from the BZA. And I have notified uh, Chief Journal that I was interested in being on the parks board. Okay. Any council questions? Mm. Any public input? All right, um, so would we first need to make a motion, someone make a motion to waive the statutory requirements for the parks board? 
Does this put an imbalance between Republican and Democrats by statute? I think that's probably a good idea. I don't know. I wish Starla was able to get on, but I don't know if that would require a resolution or anything, but at least acknowledgement in the minutes is the first step. Scott, what do you think? I'm concerned that it's not as simple as just waiving them since it's established by ordinance. I don't know that we don't have to do an amendment to set ordinance to move them outside the normal. It's just a concern. I mean, I think the worst that happens is we have to set aside his nomination, but if we can have Darla. What if we put this on the back burner until Darla is able to, to join again? Until we get her get her opinion on what to do on it. Uh, quick question, Jimmy. When's the next Parks Board meeting? Uh, March uh, first, first Monday in March. Okay, so, so we meet have, before then. Right. I, I think Trevor's probably right. If we can just put a hold on it until either later when she can get back on or until she can look at it, it's probably okay. But I'm I, like I said because it's established by ordinance, I'm worried that it's not as simple right. as just setting aside. I see Darla in here. Darla, can you hear us? She was having signal issues, remember? I can't hear. I can't hear. I can put in chat and ask her. Yeah. It might be worth it doing. Let me do that real quick. So you want to, you want to hold off to another meeting to the 28th then? And we're looking for Darla, looking for Darla to tell us that it's okay to waive the uh, the two Democrats and two Republicans. Darla, can you hear? Okay, I, I've sent her a question in chat. Okay, we, we can do that. Spring time's coming. Mike's got a lot of neat ideas for the parks, and I'd like to have a full board there if I could. But no, I understand completely. Be great. Let the public know for transparency that I basically sent Darla a direct message and she's having trouble. Do we need to make a motion to set aside the ordinance of political balance for the parks board before we appoint Ron? I think we could just kind of stop, come back to it. I'm okay with that. Want to have a motion for it? Anybody? You, you anticipate coming back to it later in the meeting, or are you thinking we're tabling it until next week? Well, next I think Dar maybe Darla will answer uh, William's question, and we can get back to it. But you're okay. whatever you guys want to do. If you okay, if you're if you guys are okay with moving on, give it. And if we haven't got a response by the end of the meeting, we can address this then. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Next thing on the agenda is Monroe County Animal uh, Management Commission. I've not had anyone come forward and volunteer to me. And you said a council member can be a member of that? I think Darla said that last time, yes. Okay. I see Darla's on now video. Darla, are you able to hear us any better? Looks like she's, that's a no. She sent a little message that she can't hear. That, yeah, that was previous. Uh, right. William, I'm going to try to call her. I just sent her a message, and I may call her and let her listen to my speaker phone on my phone. See if that okay. works. Um, I mean, if the council member is okay with it, I'm a, I wouldn't mind serving on the that board. I'm good with it. Scott, you're muted. Sorry. I'm going to make a motion we appoint William to the board. Second. Okay, Sandy. William Ellis? Yes. Scott Oldham? Yes. Trevor Sager? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you.
All right, next is award bids for the Community Crossings Grand Road Resources. Who has this? That would be Kip Hetty. Hey, Kip. Hello. Um, I went through the numbers portions of it uh, to see, you know, the comparisons with uh, the two, two bidders that we had only. And uh, Denise went through and made sure they had all the right paperwork filed. And in the end process, the award of the bid will be going to EMB Paving. Uh, their total bid was $231,400 and five cents. Uh, so that's where we're at with that. Uh, also, I need to ask, I'm not sure this is probably a question for Darla, if she can <laughs> answer another question, is that do we need to go ahead and have the council vote to uh, have the board president sign the paper? Um, this is Denise. The reason I was needing that is this is an NDOT grant and I just, I don't know if it needs to be a motion or if it's an agreement that um, spe so it can specifically state that the president, Pamela Samples, has permission to sign the agreement. Darla, I see you're in through your phone. Uh, but it looks like same issues. <clears throat> I had it. I haven't got her on the phone yet. Okay. I mean, I is there any harm with us passing a resolution to give Pam back? No, there's not. Okay. If she doesn't need it, she doesn't have to exercise it. But if she does need it, there it is. Right. We've got it. So I'll make a motion to give can, the uh, can town council can president. Hear me? Yes. Yes. William, I think we need to accept the grant and then give her permission to sign it. Okay. Accept so the bids, the award the bids first. Okay. Right. All right. So we need a motion for to accept. To award. To award. Okay. And can you give us the name again? E and B paving. Okay. Make a motion. We award the grant monies and our matching funds to E and B paving. Um, for the specified amounts as earlier stated. Second. Okay, Sandy. William Ellis? Yes. Scott Oldham? Yes. Trevor Sager? Yes. Motion carries. Make a motion. We give Pam Samples the council president permission to sign any and all documents necessary to execute the contract. Second. Sandy? William Ellis? Yes. Scott Oldham? Yes. Trevor Saker? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. And Thank also, just to let you all know as well, real quick, the uh, we've already applied for the uh, first uh, call of the 2022 Community Crossings Grants for another one for this year already. So it's in the process right now. So thank Kip, you. I want to thank you and Highway and everybody for doing a great job with the with the huh. ice and snow we had. Thank we you. We did really well. Thank you. Very testing. Very testing. Well, you passed. <laughs> thank you. Understood the assignment. Uh, all right. Uh, do we have Darla yet? I, I don't think I so. I don't think so. Okay. We're going to ordinance on first reading. Ordinance 2021-01 to amend section 36.204 of the Ellettsville Town Code to clarify paid time off, payout eligibility. Who has this? Mike Corman, would you like to address this? Sure, I'll do this. Uh, our town code uh, several years ago in our personnel policy established um, a, a small payout you could receive upon leaving service with the town. And the idea was at the time, this was probably 20, 25 years ago, that we would use the terminology similar to the state retirement system, PERF, which says you had to be uh, 10 years vested. So we just, we thought that was a good uh, connection to something of a legal document. 
that said we could, you know, have something to go by, give somebody who's been here at least 10 years, you know, a small payout of their uh, uh, unused PTO. There's a, a formula that's specified in the town code. And we have since found out there are different meanings now with what vest, uh, vested means in PERP. Some people are vested as early as two years. Some are vested in 10 years. It just depends on when you were hired. Our current uh, uh, ordinance or uh, personnel policy section is really ambiguous as to what that means. So we want to take this part about, we want to leave everything the same. We just want to take the part out about being invested in the town's retirement system and just change that to straight 10 years. Take out anything, you know, uh, uh, about PERF to say if you worked your 10 years continuous employment with the town for 10 years, then you would be eligible, much like we've done in the past, you know, almost 25 years. And then we did find an oversight yes. for the police department. And so we added a section to define the six and three employees. That's true, because originally the um, agreement, when we first did all this, the police officers were under 40 hours a week and a lot's changed since this ordinance was first came about. So that's the reason for the, uh, 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 requested for the change for first reading. Okay. Yeah, this let, let, go ahead, Scott. Let me throw a monkey wrench in this. Um, so this is only for your unused PTO, correct? Yes. That's correct. Okay. And I'm, I'm about to send Sandy over the edge here, but I'm going to ask <laughs> it anyways. Um, so <laughs> In Ellettsville, the PTO and the sick time is separated, is it not? It is. We don't currently pay out sick time at the end of someone's career, do we? No, we do not. We can't afford to. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. So the question becomes, <laughs> you pay it out a little over time or you pay it out a lot at the end because you have some employees that leave with a lot of sick time, meaning they have not taken off at all sick in their last however many years. Um, but what we traditionally see is, you know, employees who know they're going to retire at a certain date start bleeding off sick time as they should, but that results in overtime costs to us generally because we're having to backfill for those. Um, and again, I can't put a number to it because Sandy's gonna not be unhappy, she's just being realistic. We maybe need to look at something where we're buying out sick time that's left rather than just you know, allowing people to run up and then they just lose it because we're paying for it one way or the other or the employee's paying for it one way or the other. It just doesn't make any sense to me that um, essentially we're fostering a system that makes our employees lie to us over the last four or five years of employment saying they're sick when they're not because they don't want to lose the time that they're not going to get back. Does that make any well, sense? I do, I'd like to point out that the PTO is the current year's PTO and if you're planning to retire, you can save 50% of the prior year's PTO and carry it over. So the payout for a firefighter is 720 hours, for a police officer is 336, or no, I'm sorry, 594. And then for a 40 hour week, or week person, that's 336. That's already quite a liability for us to pay out. So it would definitely need to be some studying done and some figures run because you know I've written checks as high as twenty four thousand dollars when people have left with this formula. So just no, I, keep I that get it, Cindy. What I'm saying is we establish some type of formula or some type of tiered system. If you have X number of hours, it's worth this. If you have X number of hours, it's worth that. You know, and again, that that can be up to council to determine working with you and everybody else to project in the future. I'm not saying paying out by hour because you're right, we can't afford that. But on the other hand, to ask somebody to, to walk away from a thousand hours of stick that they've accumulated over the course of a career is asking quite a bit versus they well, know they're going to retire a year or two early and they start bleeding off and we're paying out overtime for shift coverage. Well, just remember, we do unlimited sick time. So there's people who get to retirement and have three or four thousand hours of sick time. So it would definitely take some calculation. I've always tried to tell employees it's like a guaranteed insurance policy because we've had a lot of people, not a lot, but several who have had to have extend, extended absences. And because of our sick leave policy, they didn't miss a single paycheck. And 
that's a wonderful thing. In the private industry, it it's unheard of. So I understand what you're saying, and I'm not saying it's not possible, but we definitely need to have some help figuring it out and, and realize the liability that we're setting up. Because when I pay out someone for, you know, 596 hours, 594, that is uh, a couple of months pay. And that means that that department can't replace that employee. We don't have that um, bank of money saved up. So they have the employee can't be replaced until we work through that payout period, which can take three months sometimes. Mm -hmm. Thank Wrong you for that. letting me speak my piece. Again, guys, and I'm not trying to, to at all bankrupt the town or hazardous. It just seems like if we're going to go one way, we need to at least consider the other way as well, because at some point we're paying for this. And you can't begrudge that to the employee that they're not going to walk away from that many hours if they know they're going to be leaving. So we're, we're essentially fostering a system that causes them to use more sick time on a regular basis than what they might otherwise be using. It's not for in-depth conversation tonight beyond this. It's just I'd like to at least see us consider some of that as we start making these adjustments. Any other comments? Now, since this is on first reading, we don't take a vote on this tonight, correct? Right. Correct. Um, next, we have Ordinance 2022-02 to amend Chapter 52 of the Ellisville Town Code to increase the sewer hook-on fee. Um, I thought we had, had this before on the agenda, Mike. Uh, this was uh, the first ordinance was to establish a policy where you had to be, um, you had to have, you had to pull a permit before you could uh, okay. get a hook on. And, um, and that was just so some of the history in our sewer system uh, way back in the day uh, was that people would buy hundreds of them even, and then they would keep them and parlay them and do this and do that. So that cleared that up. So tonight, what we're looking for is um, for you to um, consider increasing the hook on fee from $1,500 to $2,500. And this would be for all commercial or all residential hook ons. Uh, so, um, just a little history uh, when we did a rate study back in 17, 2017, 2018, uh, 2017, I believe. And even before that, um, our um, rate consultants, um, uh, we, we, we talked about raising them back then and we considered $2,500, which uh, we all kind of come to an agreement on, but it was even suggested that they be even more uh, considering the cost of um, capacity and keeping capacity in the plant and, and making sure our future um, is insured uh, with monies to uh, rehabilitate or replace the wastewater plant. Um, currently, we're in fairly decent shape as far as capacity goes, but as we grow and we grow faster than we have, um, we need to plan for the future. This, this fee only is attributed to new starts on building. It does not uh, affect our existing customers at all, and it's pretty much in line, uh, if not lower than uh, most of, um, or a lot of different towns and cities in the state of Indiana. It currently is 1,500 and we're requesting that it increases to 2,500. And Darla is on the line now uh, and she can hear. Yes. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> Council, we have some discussion on this. Honestly, I think this is long overdue. Um, we're going to have to be looking toward the future. And, you know, part of that future is keeping the costs low, but it's also covering your own costs to encourage. Uh, and I just don't see particularly as materials go up and um, more stress is placed upon this system that we, we, can't, we can't not recruit, recoup some of the costs that go into this. Mike? May I say something? Go ahead. Darla's talking. Um, 
so there's a section E in there, um, which we've had in our ordinances for some time, which requires Eastern Richland Sewer Corporation to pay an availability of fee of 1500 and if Mike Farmer said this before I got on the phone, I didn't hear it, I'm sorry. But, I mean, his proposal is to take out Section E altogether. So, if the council decides to do that, when this ordinance comes back to you for second reading, that Section E will no longer be in there, and um, Section F will be Section E. And Section F is this one that William talked about that the town council just added, actually, at the last meeting. So, And, and if I might further explain... That uh, section has always been in our contracts. We have not utilized that since 1998, at least. And uh, it's just something that it's just some uh, housekeeping, housekeeping that we didn't um, catch uh, when we put this ordinance together. So uh, E does need to be stripping when it comes back to you. And it doesn't affect how we do business past or future. Any more council comment on this? Any public comment on it? There's not a vote taken tonight, but seeing none. Um, <clears throat> we're going to go back to the Parks and Recreation Board appointment. Darla, I don't know if you saw, did you see my message to you in chat? Uh, I didn't, I'm sorry. That's okay. I was asking if we need to uh, pass a separate ordinance or pass a most make a motion to I guess how would we phrase that because the statutory partisan requirements going to be out of balance and that's also a town ordinance correct Scott I believe it is so how, how do we get over that hurdle if we want to appoint Ron okay I've sorry it's going to be out of balance because you're going to have too many Democrats too many Republicans or too many Republicans. Too many Republicans. So what's the split then if Van Devender is appointed? Sandy, what would that be? Three Republicans, one Democrat. Okay. Um, there is a statute that allows the town council to weigh the requirements that um, no more than two people be of the same party if the council specifically finds that there is a um, lack of interest in the position. So if someone makes a motion and finds that's true, then you can go ahead and, and appoint whoever you want to to the board. Okay. And just for background, I did reach out to the Democratic chairman uh, at the last meeting message them back and forth and I told them we were going to want to put this to bed by this meeting and Jimmy and I'll confirm with you an email I, but I'll confirm has anybody expressed interest from that conversation not from not from the Democratic side no Sandy anybody for you no okay then I guess we need to make a motion if we're going to do it So would the motion be first to waive the uh, requirement? Yes, the first motion would be to waive the requirement that no more than two members be of the same political party. I'll make a motion to waive the requirement that no more than two members be of the same political party. Second. Andy? William Ellis? Yes. Scott Oldham? Yes. Trevor Sager? Yes. Motion carries. Now we need to vote to appoint him to the Parks Board. Yes. I'll make a motion to appoint Ron Van Devender to the Parks Board. Second. Sandy? William Ellis? Yes. Scott Oldham? Yes. Trevor Sager? Yes. 
Motion carries. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, sorry about that. That's a noise in the background. <laughs> all right, uh, old, any uh, old business? Seeing none, flood report. Do we have one? Yes, I can give you one. Uh, right. We just received uh, an update uh, and a flood report from Christopher Burke. They are beginning the um, uh, process of submitting for permits. Um, that would be to DNR for construction in a floodway. And they're called the 401 and 404 permits, but basically one has to do with water quality. The other has to do with cut fill permit in a, um, in a creek. And, and they just, they're to ensure negative impact to the creek. So uh, pretty exciting that we've got to this process. And uh, we um, hopefully this week we'll begin uh, talking to the residents about obtaining the easements. And I'll be walk, working with a Darla's firm to um, uh, do, uh, go through that process. Awesome. I think people are pretty excited about that. Thank you, Mike. Any other council comment on that? Okay. Next, Envision Now, let's go update. Dan? I even see Chris on there, whoever wants to take it. Yes, um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, our next steering committee meeting will be uh, Tuesday, March 1st at 11 o'clock at the Eltsville Town Hall. Uh, we will not have one tomorrow. We originally uh, scheduled a meeting for tomorrow and it, we, it will not be taking place. <clears throat> the Taylor Group will be presenting the, the visioning statements and graphics and visuals and recommendations. And these final products will be for us to analyze before the community celebration. Um, for most of the meeting, we'll talk about the community celebration and how we will roll out this plan to the community, how and when. Um, celebration will be sometime in April, and uh, we're going to be thinking about a date uh, and the format for this meeting, uh, for the celebration. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, anybody that would like to come to the steering committee meeting um, on Tuesday, March 1st at 11 o'clock at Town Hall. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Kristen, did you have anything to add? All right. All right, Andy moving on. <laughs> <laughs> moving on to new business. Town of Ellettsville water tracking factor due to increase from the City of Bloomington Utilities. Mike, you're up again. Yeah, I'll start out. Uh, um, okay, Mike, you're messing up really bad. We can't. Only understand. in 2020, City of Bloomington Utilities announced they were going to raise. Uh, okay, I may have to mute my phone for a minute. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, must have been feeding back from my phone or something. But so, um, uh, in 2020, sometimes CBU announced they were going to raise their rates for all their customers, uh, uh, and that would include the wholesale customers where we buy, purchase water, and, and supply it to our, our customers. And so well, you're breaking um, up again. that rate was not, and we have our rates based on the rate. We don't know what to do. Um, we were doing so good. So, um, hey, uh, if uh, if Doug Baldessari's already on, maybe he can do a better job of explaining it and not break up. Uh, sure, I can try. You're pretty clear right now, but um, and he's when he starts talking money, it breaks up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, the city of Bloomington raised, went through a rate case with the IORC and they raised their water rates, um, all their rates, including the wholesale rates that the town of Ellisville pays for the water. As you're all aware, likely um, Ellisville buys all its water from the city of Bloomington um, to provide water services to the town. Um, and that in 
the uh, increase in that cost of that purchase water um, is 36 cents per thousand gallons um, when calculated um, based on the approved um, methodology for the IURC since Ellisville's regulated uh, tracker filing needs to be filed with the regulatory commission. And uh, there's a special 30 day filing way to do that because um, it's uh, just a pass through of the cost from Bloomington. There's no other costs of the water utility being increased. It's just for the cost of that water um, that was not built into prior rate increases because we didn't know this was coming. So, so I think we're looking for a, approval to file that, right, Mike? That's correct. And we also included new rates for hook on of the water. Uh, there's a schedule of rates for the hook on if you're building a new house uh, we are obligated to make sure that we uh, recoup our costs when somebody builds a new house and the cost of materials labor and equipment has increased uh, so um, if uh, this only impacts uh, new customers to the water system and that is in that in, in that tracker as well But how much of an impact would this have, I guess, to a standard household monthly bill? A standard household would be a dollar forty-four per month. Okay. For four for four thousand gallons. So, Mike, do we need? Do we? Is this something we need to pass, or is this something we hear the first time? How's this? Well, I'm going to say we need to pass it. So this is a first reading. Darla, can we do this in one meeting? Well, it's not an ordinance. What we need is for um, the town council to vote to approve exhibit one and to authorize the council president to sign that. And it's basically in the notice to the IURC um, requesting um, that the uh, Ellisville be allowed to increase their tap fees. Thank you. Thank so you. yes, it can be done tonight. And the plan is to get this in the paper next week. It usually takes a few days to get things in the paper anymore. So okay, and it's simple. Up, and yeah, it's to get the public notice in the paper is what I mean, not exhibit one. But if the council votes to move forward, um, Baker Tilly has prepared the um, notice that goes in the paper and also a press release that we will send to the newspaper. And then the exhibit that gets signed and um, notarized. Now those are they're all required per the uh, yes. IRC regulations. Yes. And this is both for the previous thing we discussed with the sewer hook on fee and the what rate pass through, or just the uh, rate pass through. This is the rate pass through and then the tap on fee for the water, which is the cost of the meter and to set the oh, meter. Okay. I guess waiting on council action. Well, I think as much as nobody wants to increase rates, we really don't have a choice um, because the wholesale rates, what's really driving this and we have to stay ahead uh, with that certain percentage. So I would move that we uh, allow exhibit one as well as the filings necessary to cause this to become reality to move forward and be placed into motion. Second. Daddy? William Ellis? Yes. Scott Oldham? Yes. Trevor Sager? Yes. Motion carries. Since this is just publication and it's not a vote to do it, was there any public comment on that? I missed that. I'm sorry. Okay, seeing none. All right, next thing is engagement letter between the town of Ellettsville and Baker Tilly Municipal Advisors LLC. Rate analysis for the sewage works and wholesale cost of service study. Okay, let me try to speak again and uh, let me know if I start warbling. Uh, so these engagement letters are to ask Baker Tilly to produce a rate study 
Uh, you'll see the next one is water. This one is for sewer. And um, a little history. Um, the last time we had a rate adjustment in sewer, I believe, uh, I could be incorrect, but I didn't bring my notes, but in, it was in 2017. Um, and, and then we had another rate adjustment in 2018, but the rate study was done prior to the 2017 rate adjustment. At that time, when they did the rate study, we found that um, indeed we could lower the base rate for sewer for our minimum use user uh, customers, and we increased the rate amount for flow. So um, it was unusual, but um, it, it was right after we uh, paid off the, the town uh, wastewater plant. And so during that rate study, we found that we could lower the rates for our minimum users. Um, it's good practice in the utility business to visit your rates every so often. Um, I always was taught every four years. And so uh, we, it's been since 2017 or prior to that before we, you know, we've had a rate study and uh, with inflation and the cost of everything going up, uh, including wages for personnel, I think it's time that uh, we look um, we look at a, a doing a rate study, include all the capital projects that we need to do now and that we plan to do probably for the next 10 years, update our 10-year plan. And it's just good business practice that we go through this process. I believe the amounts are in the letter of engagement. Uh, the cost of the rate study itself should be between ten dollars and $12,000. And if there's any extra um, work need to be done. They have rates for all their different partners and, um, and the staff. Now, would this be a study that would say, um, uh, you know, kind of what they would suggest we need to raise to make sure we stay ahead of the curve and not fall behind? Is that ex kind of what? It, it, it would be, and if it would be helpful, um, Doug has a chart of where we stand today uh, relative to uh, cities and towns around us and just gives you a little perspective. If, if you like, I think Doug, Doug could put those up if, it, if you think it'd be helpful. It would be for me, and also I would say that, you know, when you do this, is, is would it incur an extra cost for us to talk about instead of doing one jump to start doing incrementally each each year and ongoing kind of like a cost of living i hate to use that term because we're not talking about definitely tiling to cola but you know instead of having one big jump every year we're increasing the match projected cost so that way there's no sticker shock people know it's going to be three percent a year or two percent a year whatever it be is that something you can factor in what sustainability we would need um, uh, what, we can, Doug, we, oh, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Sorry. No, go, I was going to say, could you answer that? Oh, okay. sure. Yeah. Um, there, there, there wouldn't be any extra costs. Um, you know, we can go out three to five years on a phase in. If um, the last time we did do a phase in of the rates over multi years, um, whatever the councils, um, uh, you know, would like as far as a phase in. Uh, if you go more than three to five years. Um, then there's this public notice requirement, and I don't know, maybe Darla can talk more about that. But um, you can't just have an uh, inflationary factor that goes on forever. Um, but you, you certainly could face those rates in to ease the burden on ratepayers. Okay. And I can share uh, this. If I do this correctly, hopefully. Can you see the? Great comparison there. Yes. So that's your to sewer um, rate comparison for 4,000 gallons of usage um, for various communities surrounding and uh, like-sized communities. And you can see that the Ellettsville is is on the lower end. Um, pretty much, you know, those rates are all um, in line for the most part. But um, 
you know, you, you want to keep up, as Mike said, costs are going up for capital projects and cost of doing business and especially hitting the utilities hard. So it is a good time to look at these. Thanks, Doug. That was helpful. And I, I'd like to point out that our 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 capital project plan and our uh, normal operation maintenance of the system is fairly aggressive. I mean, we have our own uh, jet rotter. Uh, we are looking at a new TV system. It's about 15 years old. It's completely outdated, but um, we try to be pro proactive and aggressive, and we do um, uh, whole subdivisions, they're, they're the sewer mains and stuff. So uh, with that said, our rate's in pretty good shape considering how much money we try to spend on our system to continually upgrade and maintain it. Well, you'll save money over time by continually maintaining your system rather than doing it when it breaks. Correct. And it also, the, la the other thing I'd say is, uh, when we do I and I projects, it maintains capacity in the plant, which um, uh, keeps us from having to build a new plant or do any major uh, capital projects to the wastewater plant. So it saves in that way as well. Doug, you mentioned that they're not allowed to do, you know, like a regular cost, a regular increase. Is there a reason why? I mean, I know there's a law, obviously, that prevents us or the regulatory, but do you know the philosophy behind that? Well, the, the, yeah, your sewer is not regulated, but, um, and, you know, the council, you know, could do what it wants, um, but it, I, it's um, my understanding and, and um, doing this for a long time that there's, you know, whenever you change, adjust your utility rates, um, there's a public notice requirement where you have to adopt an ordinance, then hold a public hearing uh, at least 10 days after where, Every, uh, the the public can come and and object or discuss the the rate adjustments and if you just have an increase that goes on forever they don't have that um, ability to come and and discuss their thoughts. Okay. But I would defer to Darla. She's your attorney. I do have part of Title Eight in front of me. I do not have all sections of Title Eight, but as Doug said, there is a public notice requirement. I can look and see if there's something under Title Eight that would allow us to do a phase in for several years in a row. Um, uh, but right now, I just don't have that in front of me. I just have the section that talks generally about um, the public notice requirements for um, the rates. So um, I will look at that, William, and let you know if there's, you know, if we can do it, do a phase in for say four years or five years or whatever. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, we, we regularly do three to five year phase in, so I don't see that as an issue. Any other council comment? Yes. Any public comment on it? Okay, so we need council action now. Would move that we uh, give permission and instruct um, that a rate study be commissioned uh, to determine the rates as necessary for the town of Eldsville sewer and water utility. Um, in this contract should go to Baker Tilly Municipal Advisors LLC. And this is rates for water utility, sorry. IURC sure. tracker that fee services. This would be the sewer. I think we're doing sewer first. Okay, I'm sorry, then the sewer. Okay. Okay. Who is the sorry, second? Trevor. I'm yeah. You ready to vote? Yes. William Ellis? Yes. Scott Oldham? Yes. Trevor Sager? Yes. Motion carries. 
connects, probably very related, engagement letter between the town of Ellettsville and Baker Tilly Municipal Advisors, LLC, rate analysis for the water utility, IURC tracker, and TAP services. Yeah, and uh, if you can still hear me okay. Um, a little background on this one. The last time we had a true uh, rate increase was 2016, so I have to believe that the rate study was prior to that. I know we did a rate study before the uh, increase in 2016. I believe we've had a couple of trackers since then, um, not unlike the one we just approved uh, a minute ago. And so uh, if we do a rate study, we go through the IERC, we're probably looking at 12 to 18 months minimum before we could even do anything about whatever the rate study says to have looked into this and be prepared to react whatever way the rate study says. So uh, just give me some background on how long we have waited to do this. And I just think it's important that we go through this process. Any council comments on it? Any public comment? I guess it's council action. I'll make a motion to approve the engagement letter between the town of Ellettsville and Baker Tilly Municipal Ad Advisors LLC for the rate analysis for water utility, IURC tracker, and TAP fee services. Second. Sandy? William Ellis? Yes. Scott Oldham? Yes. Trevor Sager? Yes. Motion carries. Next on the list is presentation by Baker Tilly Municipal Advisors LLC, fiscal plan, capital plan, park impact fees, and business purple business personal property impact analysis. That's a mouthful. <laughs> it is. Um, I'll, I'll kind of hopefully do a proper job of leading it, leading into Doug uh, going on with the presentation. Uh, we asked them for this presentation for the board, and um, and and they're going to lay out. Um, reasons why and how um, we would go about uh, having a fiscal plan um, uh, put in place that would help us in this uh, unique time in the town's history. Uh, everybody knows about the growth and the growing pains and everything that goes with it. And part of the growing pains is uh, being prepared monetarily uh, to react to the needs of the town, whether it be personnel, um, large capital projects, um, whether it be transportation, storm related, what have you. Um, there's just a lot to it. And uh, in this day and age, it's very complex. And as busy as we are, uh, we think having Baker Tilly on board to help us with these things is very important. So um, we're going to have a meeting on the 28th, the town meeting, and then a work session about of finances and revenue streams and, and, and this very subject. And so we thought it was proper to have the presentation ahead of time, let him lay out how, how, you know, how this goes about and what the process is and, and, and monies that we pay to have this done. And then this will give us plenty of time to absorb it, uh, talk about it. I'm sure it'll, uh, um, there'll be some discussion about it and then really work on it at the work session on the 28th. So, I just think it's appropriate that we do this now and it'll lend itself to some question and answer. So without saying any more, uh, Doug's going to do the presentation and, uh, and I, I believe Doug will probably say, if you have any questions, just jump in there. So yes, go ahead, Doug. Doug. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. And I'll, thank you, Mike. And thanks council for consideration. Um, I'll share my screen if that's okay with the presentation. Can everyone see the, the cover there? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, again, Mike, Mike, that was a, a very good lead in. And this is a presentation, a uh, short present. I'll keep it short. I'm, I'm sure uh, you have a long agenda uh, ahead of you, but um, did want to go over certain pieces of the financial planning. Um, scope of service that you have um, in, in front of you uh, and how can, how it can help the town. Let's see if I can 
So, um, you know, based on our understanding, the town's going through some um, pretty significant changes with growth um, um, from new development and um, a lot of new residents coming into town um, and um, to the town. Um, and in, in order to, um, you know, accommodate that growth, there's certain um, infrastructure needs and financial needs that are, um, that, you know, that need to be planned for in order to accommodate that growth and the services that they, um, you know, should have. Um, so what, what's in the, the um, proposal before you is a, a, a fiscal plan um, for the next, next five years. Where we look at we look at a comprehensive plan of the town funds, uh, town's major funds, uh, to look current to see currently where are you right now? How are things doing? And talking to Sandy, I think things are going pretty well, um, but still to get a, a baseline um, for our finan financial analysis going forward. And then, um, as Mike talked about the capital projects, I mean, what projects do you need uh, in order to? not only maintain the town as it is, um, but then, uh, you know, accommodate the growth that's coming in and um, what additional um, payroll needs are there? Is there additional um, public safety that's needed? Are, are there capital projects that are needed? Um, we know there's the stormwater and other projects um, um, that are already in the planning stages. Um, and then how do you pay for these? Um, you know, do, do you need new revenue sources um, uh, or are the existing ones um, going to be sufficient for um, all the needs of the town? So uh, short, here we'll go over the comprehensive, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my left screen. I know that's supposed to stay looking here, but I have, have it over here next to me. Um, and here's a picture of the town that Mike sent. Thank you, Mike. And then here's some of the capital needs that you're dealing with, some of the, the stormwater needs um, and other capital needs of the town. But in this multi-year financial planning, uh, what are we looking at? We're, we're not looking at the next, just the next budget year. Um, we're looking out five years um, and, and looking at all the needs of the town, whether it be quality of life, parks and recreation, uh, public safety, um, the capital investment in roads and streets, um, economic development, um, and really to provide that financial roadmap for the town um, um, to, you know, based on the needs of the town. And, you know, this, this will be in work done in conjunction with management and the council. Um, you know, we'll provide options um, and scenarios um, based on, um, you know, what the needs are. And it's a proactive approach. It's instead of just letting things happen and, and find out, you know, maybe you're fine in five years, but you know, what, what if you're not? And there are certain things that needed to be done that, that didn't get done or you're doing them um, and using financial resources they didn't want to use because you need to do those improvements now. So the way we look at this is first, we look at where we've been where are we now and where are we going? Um, which is, I already went over some of that in the beginning. But, um, and I, I, I know, uh, and uh, I've talked to Sandy about this, you know, we, we did a comprehensive financial plan back in 2018, but, um, but that didn't have a, a huge capital component to it. Um, it. It looked at all your funds and analyzed where you are and looked for a new revenue source and it had one possible new revenue source that that, you know, that, that was presented. Um, but, you know, uh, this one, we're um, gonna add on that capital piece and how do you pay for those capital improvements? Um, is it you know, cash that you have available? Is it um, uh, new, new bonding needs? Um, is there a, a, a long-term financing that may need, be needed? Uh, you do have some, you know, that that's, um, that's rolling off and your debt service for the town is going down and, and how can new debt be layered in, structured, so that there's little rate impact um, from a tax rate standpoint? Um, so, and and you know we'll look at all the the capital needs based on information that will be provided um, by the town. Help prioritize those, and just because you have those needs doesn't mean you can afford all of them. Um, so this is a good process to go through to say you know 
maybe you can't afford all of them, or maybe you know, you, you're going to have to likely pick and choose um, what are the most most uh, needed projects. And then, as I talked about, assess current funding sources, look for new funding sources, um, which is um, one of the reasons why the 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 agreement's broken out into various pieces, and you have the you know long term um, capital financial planning. And then there's a, a park impact fee. I mean, there's there's various ways if your town's growing that you can get additional revenues. Um, uh, and uh, you know, Page is is very good with 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 town funds, much much more so than I. And so we have multi people that would would work on this if the council uh, sees the need to move forward. Um, but is there is there a TIF revenue stream you want to do tax increment financing? Is there um, a CCD fund increase? Uh, maybe we don't want to increase taxes. So how do we do that best without affecting the current um, um, residents of the town? So one of the, the the items that we've been we've been talking to uh, to to Mike and Sandy and others about is is park impact fees. Um, and here's a definition. It's a it's defined in the Indiana statute, um, but basically it's growth paying for growth. It's um, new um, residents that are coming to town pay a one time fee, and that fee goes towards uh, parks and other recreational facilities um, needed to serve those new um, new residents that are coming into town. They can only cover capital costs, so they are somewhat limited. Uh, they, you cannot use them for operational costs of your recreation, recreational facilities. Um, they're, they're, they're basically there to pay for new capital projects for um, those recreational needs for the new people coming into town. Um, but it is an additional revenue source that you don't have now. And, it, and if you do have to build more parks and recreational for quality of life in your town, um, it is a good way to get additional money so you don't have to use your current revenue streams to pay for that. As Sandy will say, you're, you're certainly not, you don't have unlimited funds. No city or town in Indiana really does or really across the country. So you do have to find ways to pay for these. And so there, there are various impact fees. I mean, you're already doing this with your sewer. You know, we just talked about that ordinance where you have an availability fee for the sewer um, that helps pay for those capacity related projects. The, the thought process is not any different with the park impact fees. It's the same concept. And the earlier you get it in, the more revenues you can generate and help offset those capital costs that are coming forward. And then the business personal property tax analysis is based on the, the law that's proposed in the legislature right now where it would do away with the inventory tax um, and how that would affect your town. Um, it, and uh, you know that's and there's a. It seems like it should be easy, but with um, you know your property tax base and tax caps, um, circuit breaker losses and and rates and levies, it is it it does. If you want to really answer, it does. It's it's not a simple calculation. So, um, that, Mike, I believe is the end of my question. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. I think it, I guess in summary, I think it really, um, you know, we're doing a lot of these for a lot of communities around Indiana and, and really across the Midwest. Um, it's a perfect time to, to um, do these studies, especially um, you know, with some additional um, grants and, and other um, um, sources of funding that are out there right now. Um, and it really could set you up for the future. Um, so I'll leave it there. But I'd be happy to answer any questions. It doesn't sound like we have any. Well, so just to kind of circle back, am I reading this right? This would not exceed $85,000 for all of it, but we would talk about $85,000. That's so correct, that yes. And Sandy, where would this come from? Well, money. 
It would depend. Um, right now, we do not have sufficient appropriations this year to pay that full agreement. We're still, um, we have an agreement with them on the ARPA money that they've been helping us with. And I think I've paid about 10,000 on that so far, and it's not to exceed 50. I don't know how much more help we'll need in that area, but uh, <coughs> the um, we would have to do an additional appropriation and pay it out of our cash. I think you're not, I'm sorry if I'm speaking where I shouldn't, but the, you know, with the change in the law with regard to the ARPA funds where you can you know, declare revenue loss and use it for any governmental purpose, I wouldn't see our services there being certainly hitting that 50. Um, okay, since the, everything's changed. Yeah, it all changed, made it a lot easier for the towns and cities, uh, just like yours. And um, just to jump in, uh, I have some definite views on where the money can come from, but the good news is we do have a couple of really good options. We have plenty of cash available through our general fund, and um, we might want to use ARPA, but I think it's a strategic decision, and that's some of the things I want to talk about moving forward. And the other thing is I uh, was looking how to compare the 2018 projections to what happened. Um, now, Doug, have you looked at those, your projections compared to what we actually did, even not doing the wheel tax? Um, I, I, I haven't. I understand that uh, things um, turned out quite a bit better, uh, but part of that was the, the income tax, additional income tax that came in. Um, and that things will change. So, you know, one of the things we talked is this a living this is a living document and and you know you know it's good for the town that came out very good any other questions from the council my guess goes to council action I guess I do have one question. Sorry, William. That's okay. And Sandy, do you feel confident? Well, I don't know how to phrase this. I guess, are you confident the monies are going to be there to pay for this? Or Mike, maybe you? Who, how, how do we even phrase this as to where we're taking the money from? Well, Well, I mean, well, this is one of those things. Go ahead, and I'll let you. You, I bow. Well, it's you know we definitely don't have it in the appropriations for 2022. So no, we can do a special appropriation. I'm just wondering, are you comfortable that there's money somewhere to pay for this? Well, I mean, our cash balances have grown um, again this year, um, so. If that is how the council wants to spend some of that excess money, that is up to you. I mean, I think that we can fund it out of the general fund if we need to. Um, and maybe it wouldn't all come due at once. I mean, they usually, uh, you know, bill me in increments as they proceed. So, I mean, it's just a judgment call on your part. If that's how you want to set aside a portion of our surplus cash right now, then we can do that. I guess Scott and Trevor, one thing I'd ask is that the last time, you know, the, the recommendations they made, I I wasn't on the council, Trevor wasn't either. I'm not sure if you were, Scott. The council didn't follow. I mean, so do you think we'll be in the same situation here? Yes and no, because I don't think, and Doug, feel free to chime in here. They're going to give us a wide range of options that we can choose to exercise or not exercise. 
as the case may be. You're right, the, the council did not take everything last go around. Um, but I thought we tried to strive for a balance and did we make mistakes? Yeah, we, we probably did, particularly on the wheel tax. But if I remember correctly, that was coming right on the heels of something else that was an imp economic impact to our citizenry. Um, and by no means do I think that anyone would tell you that whatever document they generate, and I'll be honest with you, I think this is badly needed. Uh, any document they generate is something you have to do all at once. But instead, you take uh, the best fit here, the best fit there, so that we're moving forward without unnecessarily denigrating anyone's lifestyle or, you know, hazarding their ability to pay bills, et cetera. Um, and that we're doing our due diligence and knowing what we need to be taking in in order to continue to provide the same level or greater level of services that we're already doing. I mean, we've already discussed at length um, public safety coverage, both police and fire, and how that has got to improve. And we've talked at length about the parks and at length about other things. Um, it's just a question of what becomes the priority first or in what time they are and how do we pay for those things? I because would if you don't do something, sorry, Stan, if you don't do something, um, you are going to begin to hazard growth because you're not going to have a foundation set for anyone to come to the area and, and build quickly. And as everyone can tell you, and we all know, government does not react quickly. So even if we gave the go ahead today to say, you know, hire seven or eight new firefighters, it's more likely than not somewhere between eight to 12 months before those firefighters actually hit the street. So anything we do off of this is with the understanding that we are doing it for building for the future and setting a good firm financial situation for the town to build for the future and to be able to be nimble enough to react to emerging opportunities that come our way in terms of development, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of anything else that we may need to capitalize on. Because quite frankly, right now in a lot of areas, we're tapped out. We couldn't support a lot of major projects that we may or may not be in the running for, and we need to have an ability to react to those. What I was going to say is I thought that um, this was just a presentation tonight and to start the conversation. And I would really like for you all to look the plan over and think about it and let's discuss it at the work session next at the, after the next meeting before you make a final vote. Uh, I'm, I'm inclined to that because we're two council members short. And you know, right now on the information I have, I'm not 100% sure it would pass. And we wouldn't want to kill something that we're going to, the full council would pass or vice versa. So I'm kind of leaning towards what Sandy just said. Oh, I can see the wisdom in that, but I don't want to get us into a situation where we're, what's going to amount to six weeks down the line before we take any action on this. So leaving this just for discussion at the work session, I don't know that that's necessarily wise, but definitely holding off the two weeks until our next meeting and everyone can be present, I think most certainly has value to do it. And if, if I might add to this discussion, um, uh, I had Doug give us a proposal um, so we could talk about it and think about it. And you'll notice it has line items when you look at it. So uh, we can do all of the the proposal at once, or we can um, cherry pick what we want done first. Obviously, the um, the capital planning, the physical plan would be that's the main course, if you will. And so, uh, but it, but it is a, in a line item order. So we you know we, we we could do some now and some later. So there's all kinds of good options here. So it, you really need to vet it and look at it and and I think there ought to be some, maybe some discussion uh, back and forth between the department heads and the board and between the board themselves uh, so maybe we would be prepared on the 28th because I agree uh, every time we delay uh, something else happens and anything that you start now really is six or eight weeks off even getting off the ground. Well, and I would also say that the last piece of the proposal is for um, to calculate the losses from the removal of personal property tax. 
And that's still being debated in the legislature. They raised the um, exemption in this year from 40,000 to 80,000. And I've talked to the auditor's office and you know we are gonna lose approximately 14,000 due to that. But the growth of the town is in so good right now that we aren't gonna notice that loss not this year and probably not next. So I, I might ask that we hold on the personal property evaluation, number one, till it becomes law. And then um, if it is passed, then we can re, re, revisit that need. So what do you want to do here, William? I don't know that this necessarily needs a motion to table because it wasn't introduced for passage, was it? No, it was presentation. No. Yeah. So no, I, no. it's I guess it's up to council action what we want to do. So if we can just we discussed it, we can move on to the next agenda point. I'd be comfortable with that. Yeah, I agree. Okay. All right. All right, so next thing is privilege of the floor or public comments and things not discussed. Have anybody? Hey, William is Krista. I just wanted to say a couple things on actually on the conversation that just happened. Um, I think I thought it was a really good conversation and I really liked what Scott had to say about investing in the future. And I guess I would just encourage you and all of us as a community to be proactive. Um, I think we've got to get ahead of growth. And so I just, I just want to say, I think that it was a really good conversation and I think it's worth investing into the future and exploring our options, not just to, not just to pay for the growth that's happening to us, but to create the community that we want to create. So, um, Anyway, I was happy to listen tonight and hope I can attend more frequently and, and be supportive of your work. Thank you. Anybody else? Before we go to supervisor's comments, I just, I, actually I'll get council comments, but uh, supervisor comments, any supervisor? I'd just like to thank you. Department of Public Works for working during the storm event. I mean, they worked Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I believe Saturday. Uh, they um, they fixed two mains, and then some of them went out and plowed for Kip. And Kip's crews was added all town facilities after they got done with the roads. And then they fixed another main break. I believe it was Saturday. I kind of lost track of time myself. Um, so the, the DPW guys were really on it. I mean, they just worked their rear ends off, um, and they were they were exhausted at the end of it. And uh, I really appreciate the effort. The effort was unbelievable. Thanks. Thanks I so I can, I'll just follow right behind Mike there, real quick. Uh, I, uh, half of the crew came in early the night that the ice was coming in because they were worried they were kind of the outlying areas that they wouldn't be able to make it into the, to go to work if we needed to go to work. Uh, it was very hard to know when to start because of it would rain and they'd go to sleep and they go back to rain and they'd go to sleep. So, uh, you know, you don't want to put the material down there and watch it just wash down the drain. So it, it was trying to get the perfect timing to get started, to try to stay ahead of it. Uh, like Mike said, uh, it's the combination of utilities and street guys now, and with the main breaks that they had, plus the, the, the weather that we had to go along with it. Uh, I'm very happy at how well it turned out. I've uh, been pretty fortunate. Uh, also, uh, the last couple of years now, uh, Monroe County Emergency Management has been reaching out to the town I know that uh, Scott Oldham and uh, the fire chief and, and the, the police chief know about this because they're usually involved in it with uh, the, the, the public sir, or safety side of it. Uh, but they've been very helpful about helping us be prepared for it. Uh, 
Uh, we kind of interact with each uh, division of the county to, to see what, how everybody's set up and ready to go. Uh, and I think it went really well this, this time. Any other supervisors? I do. Uh, echoing what's been said already, we had a few firefighters come in early, some stayed later, and the call volume was uh, very low. Uh, and I want to thank the community for being responsive and not getting out unless they literally had to. So that was uh, beneficial to us. And the few calls that we had were definitely storm related, uh, which is somewhat expected. So we were pretty happy. So I'm um, glad people came in and uh, our firefighters came in and helped out and made sure the uh, lot was cleared uh, on a regular basis along with the street department they helped us out a couple of times. It was all good. So uh, uh, just appreciate the community for, you know, paying attention to the uh, uh, weather warnings. All right. Any other supervisors? Council comments? I just quickly want to thank Ron uh, for his thorough report. I don't know if the other council members got it. I think he delivered it to all of them, but I really appreciate that. It gives a great, I think Trevor said it earlier, a great snapshot of where our growth is in Ellisville. So, Ron, I, I appreciate that. I truly do. And I agree, Krista, about we need to invest in our future. We definitely do. I'm glad we're having this conversation. All right. Um, any other business before the council? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Sandy? Who seconded? Trevor. Okay, thanks. Um, William Ellis? Yes. Scott Oldham? Yes. Trevor, Sa Travis? Trevor Sager? Yes. Sorry about that. Meeting adjourned at 7.52. Thank you. Thank Nine. you all of you for being patient with me on my first time trying to corral things. Recordings.